If you look back to the gloom and despair of the Garden of Gethsemane, when our Lord and his disciples went there on the night before his crucifixion. It is not, now that we know the truth after all these centuries, a pleasant scene. It is a scene of woe for the man of sorrows. He knows better than anyone else what is going ahead of him. He's as human as you are and I am. But resting on his shoulders are, is a thought that no one can do what I have to do. No one else in this world, past or in the future, can do what I alone can do. And in that prayer... You can look at John 17, Luke 22, Matthew chapter 22. You'll see him, to say the least, pouring out his heart to God. He is in mental and emotional agony. He is intense in seeking to do what he alone could do. And now I'm going to give you what I believe to be a few words, seven in all, in a sentence, that are the most difficult for any person on earth to do consistently with regularity and steadfastly. After he had said to the Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. He then said this, not my will, but thine be done. Now stop for a moment. How many times have you heard that read from the pulpit? Maybe studied it as you studied this book in Bible class or in your reading at home. And yet, did we give it the thought that it requires of us? When God created us in his own image, he made us free creatures to choose. We have this life to prove to God we will love him with all that we are, love our neighbors as ourselves, and when we become Christians, to love the other members of the church, members of the spiritual body of Christ. Those who have believed and obeyed the same gospel that all other Christians believed and obeyed when they became Christians. Not my will, but thine be done. I suggest to you that therein lies the problem for most people on this earth. And I will go beyond that for all people on this earth. No one has ever become a Christian as that term is used in the New Testament and is defined therein. But they fully understood, at least at that point of their knowledge, that I'm saying no longer will I do as I please. No longer will my likes or dislikes take precedent over the will of Jesus Christ that the only thing I am here to do is the will of God. So not my will, but thine be done, has great, great significance and importance to each one of us. There's not a soul who, if they do so, obey the gospel today anywhere in the world that didn't come to grips with that in their own lives. They resolve. No longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight, as the old song says. But they resolve to lay aside the past, die to their past sins in repentance, and then submit to the will of Jesus Christ completely in being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. 
not my will, but thine be done. When you think of sin being the transgression of the law, whether it's omitting what God says we must do or otherwise, commission, then we see that sin is the result of transgressing not my will, but thy, God's will, be done. All of the woes of the world have resulted from reversing the order of that prayer. Not thy will, but mine be done. There's the problem. It's the problem in an individual's life, between husbands and wives and families. Anywhere you want to look, it's the reversal of what Jesus said that is the root of problem. It's not letting Christ have his way with me. And that means I'm a free moral agency to be able to do that because it also implies I don't have to. Let him have his way with me means I know his will. I've done what's necessary to know it and I see then what his will is for my life. All the way back to the beginning, beginning, you find that God told Adam and Eve that they should not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2.17. Now what do they do? They said, not your will, but ours be done. God delivered Egypt, or rather Israel, from Egypt. Egyptian bondage. He provided for them all those things they needed. They couldn't provide for themselves. Oh, how much grace is involved in delivering them from bondage in Egypt without ruling out on their part the importance of their will, submitting to God's will and obedience. They had to follow the directions of Moses as God spoke through him. And God then at Mount Sinai gave them a law. And here is what in the restatement of that law that Moses told them on the east side of Jordan before he died and Joshua took his place to lead them over to conquer the land of Canaan. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 12, Beware, lest thou forget the Lord. The psalmist in Psalm 106, verses 13 through 14, says of Israel... They soon forget his works and waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Now, what caused that departure from God? For if you go back and read about Israel when they're beginning their wanderings, even though many of them rebelled and they died, and eventually, 40 years of wandering, only two of the original, 20 years old and upward, Joshua and Caleb entered the land. All the rest above that age died for the rebellion. When you look at their situation, what was the problem? Not thy will, God, but thy will be done. You'll see it in particular instances that have been referred to lately in the case of Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus 10, verses 1 and 2. Scripture says they offered strange fire, which the Lord had not commanded. Thus, they did not get the fire from where God said, you get the fire. It was not authorized. Anything not authorized is strange. People want to put sprinkling in the place of immersion for baptism. That's strange. People want to partake of the Lord's Supper. They call it that anyway, once a year, once a quarter. That's strange to the New Testament teaching. And so on you go. Anything not authorized by God, you can call it whatever you want to call it that the Bible calls it, but if it's not as authorized by God, it's strange to God. And that's what's meant. And so their disobedience resulted in their deaths. More from the standpoint, if you read the account, of their just being negligent. 
not seeing it was that important. Well, how many times have you seen brethren? And how many times have you been tempted by Satan to say, well, really, is that that important? If God ordained it to be so, is that which you must do? That's an imperative. Therefore, your faith in God is being put to the test to one degree or the other. Will you abide by His will? Will you take Him at His word? And the Bible's replete with situations like Nadab and Abihu. They died as an example for us if we're not careful what we believe, doing only that which is authorized. One of the classic examples of not thy will but mine is found in the case of King Saul in 1 Samuel 15. The command to the king was, go smite Amalek. And utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep and ass. But when you go along with the rest of the account, the scripture says, Saul and the people spared Agag the king. And the best of the sheep and the oxen, verses uh, chapter 3 or verses 8 through 9, 3, 8 through 9 rather. Saul's explanation later was that these were spared. Now notice how he'd worked this out in his mind. In other words, it's still not God's will but his and the people be done. But here's how he worked it out in his mind. That they were going to take these things and offer them as sacrifice. It didn't make any difference what they were going to do. There was no authority from God for them to act that way. Verse 22. All verse 22 makes it clear and will always be a principle for those who love the Lord and seek to keep His commandments, who desire above all to be well-pleasing in His sight, to obey is better than the sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Thus, the conclusion of the whole matter, according to the inspired Ecclesiastes writer, is to fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. But Saul and evidently the people had the attitude of not thy will, but mine be done. But the principle, whether it's in patriarchy, the mosaical system for the Jews, or the Christian system, is that it is to obey rather than sacrifice. That's the key. Nothing else will do. Anything that you call service to God that causes you to commit a sin of omission or commission, it's just that. It separates you from God. Let's pause a minute and remind ourselves sin is the only thing that can separate you from God. It's the only thing. You may not even how you felt this morning when you got up. Or how you feel. Time goes on when you go to bed tonight. If it doesn't involve sin, it won't separate you from God. Sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4. If you look at the prayer of Jesus in that miserable state, when his best and dearest to him among men wasn't bothering them, they were asleep. They, they didn't grasp what Jesus was about to go through. They didn't understand, but he did. Like none of us can. When he was only 12 years old, he said, I must be about my father's business, Luke 2.49. Now, I obeyed the gospel when I was about midway of my 12th year. And I know being who I was, and my background, and my education, my ability, if I could understand the importance of doing that, a whole host of other folks can. I don't think I'm a step ahead. In fact, probably behind IQ-wise, a lot of folks. But I understood I was lost in sin. 
Did I understand the full gravity of what sin was? No, I knew I was lost and I wanted to be saved. And I understood the plan of salvation. I understood what it was to believe in Christ, repent of my sins. You say, well, what can a 12-year-old repent of? Well, if you recognize because you're accountable to God that you've transgressed God's will, whether it's one sin, ten, or a hundred, you resolve in your heart to die to a life of sin. And better at 12, 13, or 14 so to do than to wait till later on when you acquired the habitual practice of certain sins and got yourself involved in things to where it becomes much more difficult to get out of them and walk the straight and narrow way of truth. In discussing appetite with the disciples, look at the attitude of, of our Lord. My food, my sustenance, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his work, John 4, 34. Not my will, but thine be done. And again, in John 6, 38, Jesus said, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Do you see what that would do for all of us if we could day in and day out imbibe and practice that principle? His purpose on earth was not my will but thine. Now, why? Because he couldn't do for us to save us from our sins if he hadn't had that attitude. Well, we're members of the spiritual body of Christ if we're members of the Lord's church. We have a mission nobody else on this earth has but the church of Christ. And we should have the same attitude of our Savior who placed us in that church when we were baptized. When he came near the close of his life, then he prayed to the Father, I have glorified thee on earth. Now stop there for a minute. I can't glorify God on earth like Jesus Christ, the Son of God, glorified him on earth because he was tempted in every point like us. We, uh, we are yet without sin. He was complete. He was perfect. He never sinned. But one who's been redeemed from sin by submitting my will to his and the gospel plan of salvation and being a member of his spiritual body and his blood continuing to cleanse me, 1 John 1, 7, the blood that he shed on the cross that I contacted when I was baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3, and 4, that I can continue to glorify him by being faithful to him. There is no other way to glorify God as a human being on this earth but to be a faithful member of the church of Christ. No way whatsoever. All of the things people have done, let's just take this past week. People have been fed. People have gone out of the way to help folks who were in dire conditions with their water pipes burst. And all the things that came along, the power outage, People helping people. Wonderful. But if they didn't do it as Christians to serve God, then it's not taken note of from the standpoint of being that which you did as a servant of God. Atheists did the same thing. Hindus did the same thing. Buddhists did the same thing. Muslims did the same thing. They help people. God doesn't take note of that when you're not glorifying Him. And what's the way you glorify Him? Only one way. His will being done in your life. I have glorified Thee, Jesus said to His Father, on the earth. And would that we all would be able to say this as He did at the end of His life. I have finished Thy work which Thou gavest me to do. Has God given us as Christians a work to do that's peculiar to us as His children? Has God charged the spiritual body of Christ, the church, to be busy about things that the world is not expected to do because they are the world? They're lost in sin. They're outside of Christ. Indeed so. For all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1, 3. 
We prayed together this morning in this worship assembly. And we've assembled today because of the will of our Lord for us to assemble. And in that assembly, one of those things to do is that we pray. And we're promised in the scriptures that he will hear and answer our prayers. Everybody doesn't have that blessing. When you as an individual pray at home, the disposition in that prayer is to live like the Lord wants us to live. And you may pray for specific things in your life, but knowing you're a finite human being, you will say, not my will, but thine be done. I think to fully appreciate the prayer of our Lord in Gethsemane, is that we must understand that he left the glory of heaven and the presence of the Father to come to earth. And he did so by becoming a human being. I just don't believe we'll ever grasp what he gave up to do that. And Paul tells us he forever remains a human. The man Jesus Christ is the only mediator between God and man. The man. He's glorified humanity. He pictures for us what we shall be if we die faithful. But Christ, the second person of the Godhead, forever remains a man. Never going back to the way that he was before. Glory he has like he had before. Yes, but he remains a man. How was he treated when he was here? Well, the world fell over itself to receive him. No, the world treated him then as it's treated now. He was despised and rejected of men. You know where that comes from? 750 years before Jesus walked this earth. That's what the prophet said of him. Isaiah 53, 3. Do you think Jesus knew that's what he was stepping into? Even though his mission was to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19, 10. He was envied. He was misrepresented. He was lied about. He was hated. And all by those who should have recognized him for who he was. The Messiah. This was for the religious leaders. Praying in the garden, he knew his death was near. And notice what he says. I lay down my life. No man taketh it from me. What a thought. But I lay it down of myself. John 10, 17 through 18. Do you remember on the cross? When he had suffered to the uttermost, no more, no less. He then declared, it is finished. Father, into thy hands, look at his will expressed, I commend my spirit. He willed himself to die when he had suffered to the uttermost. No man took it from him. He didn't have to go to the cross. He makes it clear he had all of these uh, thousands of angels he could call to rescue him. So he was willing to die that shameful, agonizing death on the cruel cross with the attitude of not my will, but thine be done. That's the basic character trait of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And it should be reflected in you and me and will be to the best of our ability as members of his spiritual body, the church. Notice what is said about him as to why he did this. Paul addressed the church in Corinth in the second epistle, second Corinthians chapter eight and verse nine. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Jesus lived what he taught. That prayer of our Lord should be a pattern for your life and mine. It would, it would solve so many problems and prevent a great many problems, if not most all of them, from ever arising. 
Because everybody that's a faithful member of the church would say when something seemed to be a problem, let's go settle it with what the Lord said in the book. Let's be willing to give and take on matters that have nothing to do with what God obligates us to do to be saved. But basically, when we honestly take out all the clothing off of whatever the thing is, that we see is just a matter of I want my way. All through my life as a preacher, I've watched congregation after congregation and every one I have ever preached in to one degree or the other. There have been people that have caused all sorts of problems that when you boil it right down to where the problem was, it was we will not submit our wills. There's a reason even when it comes to the organization of the church, and that's a divine organization. It came from the mind of God, just as the plan of salvation, that he said elders to oversee the church and deacons to serve and preachers to preach. There's a reason the writer of Hebrews inspired of the Holy Spirit in stemming a tide of apostasy among the Jewish brethren said in Hebrews 13 verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you. That means submitting my will to somebody else's. And it doesn't mean I submit when I like it because that is no submission. Submission is when, well, I don't understand why. I don't see the ramifications. But if that's what they've decided and it doesn't violate the will of heaven, then I'm in submission to them. No, I've seen it too many times from the very beginning of my preaching work to now and visiting with others throughout the brotherhood over all these years. And it'll continue. Because one of the strongest things we have is I want my way. I had occasion recently to say to a lady, I took a chance when I did this, but it was a perfect chance and I couldn't pass it up. I hardly know the lady, but she was complaining before everybody, and she didn't know me either, about her husband going to the grocery store and calling her about what to buy and where it was located and how much he was worrying her to death. Why doesn't he just ask somebody there? I just said, why aren't you glad that he sees enough in the matter to call you to find out what you want? And she starts playing with her hair, which means I heard you and I understand it, but that's not what I want. I did all I said. All I said. We got to make a distinction. We must make a distinction between the will of God and the will of man. Yours or mine. It's amazing how we can't see that. Well, my will is pretty important to me. Now, you may not have literally done this, but in your mind you did. As a husband and wife, grit your teeth at your spouse. <laughs> And according to the spouse, you may not dare get your teeth, but that spouse knows you did. <laughs> but the point is, I go through all of this to say, the main problem is where we started out with in the first place. Our wills. Think about the wife and the teaching of the Bible on the role of the husband and the wife. He's in that. That doesn't mean he has the right to tell her to do things that are sinful. That's not the point. In the most godly homes, where both want to do God's will, he is the head of the house. He rules out of love. Well, somebody has to submit to somebody when the chips are down. And if she doesn't understand that, there's going to be a problem. And if he doesn't understand he rules out of love and concern for her and her role and the children, if they're children, there's a problem there. But it won't make any difference. God said the man's the head of the house. Does anybody want to fight that? Does anybody want to rise up and say, God didn't know what he was talking about and he put that man in the head of the house? Well, I certainly not. What it does is place a great responsibility upon a person who becomes a husband because he must realize God has given him that responsibility and taught him in the Bible how to exercise it properly. Loving a wife as Christ loved the church 
and gave himself for it is a challenge that we husbands will face all the days of our life and never really measure up to it. And submitting to your own husbands, as Paul told Timothy and Titus to preach, is not always going to be easy. And children being obedient to your parents, well, that's almost become a laughing thing to even expect it in our present day society. Does it always mean their opinion is the only opinion? No, it could be another opinion. Later on, it might be on the same matter. But that's their decision now. And that's what the children are submit to, and that's the guy of the house. That's the role, the divine role, the will of God regarding those things. I use that because that's so intimate. We live with it every day. Therein we make those mistakes. And that, again, is another reason for Christians to marry Christians. They'll all have the same disposition of heart toward God and toward the Bible and toward serving God. The application of this prayer will make a difference all day long, every day. It would in the standpoint of not thy church, but mine. That's what's going on in the world today. When it should be not my church, but thine. Jesus said, I'll build my church. Does he have a church? Yes, he does. He purchased it with his blood. He adds all he saves to that church, Acts 2.47. And we ought to want to be a part of that church or no other church. And we ought to learn how to do that by believing in Christ, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in Him and being baptized into Christ. Galatians 3.27 For the remission of our sins, Acts 2.38 And the Lord adds us to the church. And therein we live as His will. He is the only head directs us to live. And there must be not my will but thine be done. So I close saying again, how shall we live our lives? Well, for what does a man profit if he gain the whole world, lose his own soul? And then the admonition, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Nothing works in Christianity and in, of course, serving God, except you adopt and work from, by understanding what it means in everyday life, the view that Jesus uttered, in the garden, not my will, but thine be done. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.